We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. Hey, my name is Mike Miller. I'm one of the pastors here on staff and I will just add real quick, the reason why the cafe team was able to take that one is because they caffeinated y'all. Um, we're not cheating, they are. So, well, I'm excited to be able to share today's message with you. Today we are starting a five-week series, like Pastor Matt said, called Miracles. Uh, and I absolutely love talking about the different miracles that you see throughout Scripture. I love reading about different miracles uh, that, that Jesus performed, and I especially love hearing about them uh, even more in person whenever they happen all around us, because they do happen all around us. You know, uh, uh, today I've heard a lot of people call a miracle luck, or they've called it uh, coincidences. Uh, but I'll tell you, it's neither of those things. It's, it's just God doing God, God doing what God does. Uh, you know, I've heard people say they don't believe a miracle uh, whenever it happens. They can see it right in front of their eyes, and they'll say, I don't believe it. It's not true. It's made up. It just proves ignorance, and it proves that they're either hurt or disappointed that something hasn't taken place in their life that they have wanted the way they've wanted it to happen. And some people, they hear about a miracle, and they get super inspired about it, and that's just the best because then the story continues, and they keep telling other people, and other people start to have faith, and other people start to experience miracles in their lives as well. So I just love of that, but I'm going to open up with you today and get vulnerable a little bit later in, in, in the message. I want to ask you for permission, uh, because I'll tell you, there's times where when I talk about what I'm going to talk about, where I get uh, choked up almost every time, um, and I can promise you, it probably will happen today too. Uh, but, um, you know, something that happened in my family uh, about nine years ago, give or take, like a year probably was when it started, but, um, you know, I, I truly believe that miracles happen all around us today. Uh, I believe that miracles are real because I've experienced them in my life, uh, and I believe that they exist today just as much as when Jesus was walking on earth. And I believe that you have a miracle in your life that is waiting for you, uh, that, that something that is going to happen that's incredible in your life as well. So let's pray together real quick. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would do miracles the way that you always have done in our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, how many of you ever heard the saying, the devil is in the details? You ever heard that? It's a common phrase that you hear. I, hear, I used to hear it all the time when I would work in programming um, because, you know, one little comma messes everything up or one lack of a comma makes your whole algorithm not work. Well, I've, I've heard this saying over and over again. It's, the saying simply implies that, that while something might seem simple at first, there is often more complexity in the details. And I think that when, when we talk about the miracles of Jesus, it rings partially true, it, it, that saying does, and I say partially true because I don't believe the devil should ever get credit for anything that, that Jesus ever does or has done. I don't think the devil should ever get any credit for it, but the context, the details of every miracle are super important to understand and to, and to give credit to. It, it would be irresponsible for us to say, Jesus healed this sick person. Jesus healed the leper. Jesus healed the blind man, but then ignore the details around it. It would be irresponsible. And so a lot of times when you hear about these different types of miracles and you leave out those details, it may encourage you, which is great because that might be the healing that you need. But I want to tell you this today. Miracles, whatever miracle you are praying for, God is already working Whatever miracle you're praying for, God is already working. It says this in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. But notice the scripture here starts with a particular word. That word is and, which means that's a, there's a clear indicator that you need to go back a little bit and figure out the context. For the sake of time and getting to this message, I'm going to fly through a few of these verses real quick. Uh, just to give you the context here. Starting in verse 24, it says, We were given this hope when we were saved. 
if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't, need, we, we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts know what the, knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Then we get back to verse 28, and it says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose for them. Church, listen real quick. You can speak boldly and you can speak confidently with hope when you are praying for a miracle. Because when you were saved, when, when, when you received Christ as your Savior, you received the Holy Spirit who is there to help you when you feel weak. He's there to plead for you in harmony with God's will, which is found right here in the Word of God. And church, you can have hope every single day knowing that God knows your heart and what you need. And no matter what the situation is that you're stuck in, no matter how scary the health situation that you are in is, no matter what, God is working in your life and causing everything to work together for the good of those who love him. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, so you know, miracles, when I think about miracles, I, I, I tend to, to think miracles really go beyond turning water into wine. It goes beyond healing the leper, uh, raising the dead. Miracles even go beyond feeding uh, thousands of people with two fish and five loaves of bread. And I, I believe that it was two fish and so many loaves of bread because who doesn't like a roll from Texas Roadhouse? But miracles started at creation. In fact, miracles probably started even before that for all we know, but miracles started in your life before you were born. And, and you're probably asking, well, how can you say that if there's no record of it? I can say that because I know that God's always existed and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means Way back when, before anyone was here, he worked miracles. That means back in the Bible times that we're reading about today, he worked miracles. And that means today in your life and forever, for the rest of your life and for the rest of eternity, he'll be doing what he does. And I believe that if we start to, to seek uh, revelation through prayer and we open our eyes to the context of what we read here in the scripture, you'll see that miracles happen when you get desperate for God. They happen when you become aware of his authority and of his power, and when you become strong in faith, they happen. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Mark 5. If you don't own a Bible, we want you to have a copy of God's Word. And so there's a Bible in the seat in front of you. You are welcome to take that Bible, write in it, uh, and make it yours. We just ask that you would dig into it and read it daily and, and start to grow in your relationship with God. But we're going to start reading from Mark chapter 5, and I'm going to read a chunk of Scripture today. Uh, I believe that's okay, right? I mean, I heard a, a, one of my favorite pastors one time was talking, and he said he had told the, the church they're going to read a huge chunk, and there was people in the congregation that went, oh. And he was like, oh, come on, guys, you're in church. So we're going to start in verse 21, and it says, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. And when, when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, saying, my little daughter is dying. He said, please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. And Jesus went with him and all the people uh, followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she had suffered a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Church, point number one that I want you to, to, to make note of or write down is become desperate. Become desperate. In this same passage that I just read, you see two different situations where people are in need of healing. And what I see is two situations where they, they both became desperate. You know, I've always heard in my life, probably all of my life, my entire life, I've heard people say that being desperate isn't a good thing. It's not a good look, right? You got that boy, the high school boy that is or probably middle school and up, really chasing after this girl, wanting to have a girlfriend. He's desperate to have a girlfriend. Then you got this girl who's desperately wanting to, to be asked out to prom, 
or whatever it is, and you're just like, oh, this is so eye-rolling, desperate, like this is so annoying. And then you got the, the adult cases, like you got the guy who, who submitted his resume, and, and, and he's, he just submitted it, and he starts calling and going, hey, I, I sent in my resume. Did you receive it? Did, did you review it yet? And they're like, hey, uh, yeah, you just sent it. Give us some time. And then he keeps calling. He's sent, he, you know, he sent it 18 minutes ago, and he's already called 13 times. And you're just like, gosh, you're so annoying, dude. We're going we're gonna to block you now uh, because you're desperate. But here in our world, desperation can easily become the reason for denial. But listen, being desperate for God is a whole different situation. Being desperate for God is a way of worship. It's a way to show his worth in your life. It shows how you value him. It shows that he is worthy of your praise and of your adoration. Desperation makes, him, makes our need for him real. You know, what happens when you're desperate? You find out that you do just about anything. Am I right? You do just about anything when, I, when, when you're desperate. You know, when I met Michelle, she was working at Bank of America just... Down, uh, down the road, uh, you know, near 8th Avenue. Uh, it's a two-level building, right? And I walked in there one day for interviews, and I'd seen her before. I walked, I walked in there a few times to get some checks cashed and stuff, and I've always been like, hmm, all right. But I was not going to embarrass myself. I was this high school kid. Still, I was in 12th grade. I was like, there's no way. Uh, she's clearly older than me and stuff. I'm not going to embarrass myself. So I, I waited, you know. And then I eventually got an interview there because I needed a better job than what I had. So I got an interview, and I walked in this, day, this one day, and I walked in there, and I'm like, all right, so, wow, there she is. She's hot. And I was like, I'm not in high school anymore. I can do this. So I walked over to her and said, hey, uh, do you know where the uh, interviews are? And when I tell you she snapped at me, <laughs> I mean, she snapped at me. She literally was like, I don't remember exactly what she said, something along the lines of, uh, did you read the sign? It's upstairs. And I'm like, dang, okay, she's mean. She's still fine, though. <laughs> and so I was like, <laughs> little did she know the sign was blocked by the security guard standing in front of it. So there was really no sign. There's no way I would have seen this sign. And so I, you know, I went upstairs. I interviewed. The whole time I'm thinking, i got to work here where she's at. And so I, I, I was like, all right, how do I do this? So I interviewed there. They, the interview went decent. Then I interviewed at another branch. And, and I, got, I got the job at the other branch, just the one here around the corner on Hospital Drive. And so in the meantime, I'm going, all right, I still need to know her, so I'm going to drive over there as often as I can. I accepted uh, uh, some, some things that I could do to, to extra responsibilities to be able to go there and help her at her, or not her, but help her branch. I really could have cared less about what happened to that branch. I just knew that she was there and I needed to talk to her. And so... You know, I went over there and helped her and stuff. And then I started doing things that I think every guy who's desperate for a girl would, uh, would do, right? So, like, I skipped classes at AACC to go and see her. I, I, I left, or I, I went to work late to bring her breakfast, and I, went, I left work early so I can go get her favorite chocolates and stuff and, and sent them through the drive through I did all kinds of things uh, to get to know her. I would have done just about anything. And I'll tell you, it worked because she's my wife now, and she's still just as fine. I promise you. She is, whew. And so my point is this. My point is this. Desperation will open up doors that complacency will keep shut. Desperation will open up doors that complacency will keep shut. And this woman with the issue of blood was complacent for years. She, had, she, had, she knew she had an issue. She knew she had this problem. She went to doctors whenever she could, and she couldn't really afford it anymore. And so she, she kind of just laid low at this point going, I don't know what else to do. Uh, then she finally got truly desperate when she heard about a man who could perform miracles, when she heard about a man who could heal and so she did what? She pushed through this crowd, hundreds probably, if not thousands of people to get to Jesus. Have you ever walked through an airport on a busy holiday or walked through uh, Walmart on Black Friday? It's crazy. It, you know, there's, I remember traveling with Michelle one day and uh, before we had kids and stuff, we would travel alone and, and she, I, we we're trying to get through the crowd, trying to get to our terminal and stuff. And I'm like, all right, we got to do this. And so it's busy and I'm following her because she's smaller. So she's slipping through the cracks. Next thing you know, I'm behind the slowest people in the world and she's 200 people up there and I'm going, I can barely see her head. I don't know what's going on anymore. I don't know if I'm going the right way. And she's just like, 
Where in the world is he? And, and that's prob- I can only imagine what this lady was thinking. She's probably thinking, how in- I can see him. How am I going to get to Jesus? How am I going to get to this man? I need this healing. I am going to get trampled on. I- There's no way. I'm not-, I'm not bigger than these guys that are blocking me. How am I going to get to him? If I can just touch the hem of his robe, I would be healed. Desperation will pull things out of you that you didn't know were there. When you get desperate, it gets God's attention. Let's continue to read, starting in verse 29. It says, Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that power had gone out from him, and so he turned around in the crowd and he asked, Who touched my robe? And his disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing against you. How can you even ask who touched me? But he kept looking around to see who had done it. And this, then this frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. Y'all, her desperation got the attention of Jesus. And when she finally touched the hem of his garment, more than ever, she became aware of his authority. Point number two today is become aware of his authority. Miracles will happen when you become aware of his power and his authority. Let's continue to read in verse 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus and the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this, weep- why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. He took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying, holding her hand. He said to her, Talita Koum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then they told them to give her something to eat. I firmly believe they sent, they, they, he told her to bring told them to bring her to Chick-fil-A. There's no other explanation. So I want to focus real quick on verses 40 and 41, and I'm going to reread it to you. It says, the crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was laying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha Kohn, which means little girl, get up. Talk about negative Nancys. Sorry if your name's Nancy, if you're in the room, or if you're watching online, your name's Nancy. I'm not talking about you. Maybe I am. I don't know. But they were so negative. These were the, t- these were the type of people that, that light up the room. They really light up the room, when they, but when they walk out, not when they walk in, right? They, they laughed at Jesus. So what did he do? It says that he put them out. He kicked them out of the room. You, you ever been in a situation where you're really trying to get things done? You're, maybe you're on a phone call for work or something, and your kids are being so loud or in, and interruptive, and you just had to tell them to get out? You know, sometimes you catch it early enough, you catch yourself early enough to do it politely or as kindly as you can, and you're like, hey, sweetie, daddy really has to focus on, on his work or his meeting right now. Can you just take those toys and go to the other room and play? Um, and then there's those times where it's already been a frustrating time, a frustrating day, and she's and making so much noise, and you just immediately snap, and you're like, get out! And then she's like, oh, okay. Or maybe that's happened to you as an adult. <laughs> hope, hope you learned your lesson. But the parents didn't need any of that negativity they, at all. They knew that they had Jesus in the room now. This is the one that Jairus went so many miles to, to get to, and, and they got him back here in their room. They knew what he could do, but still the enemy tried to steal the faith that they had in Jesus. He tried to blind them of his power and authority. And so, so these people heard Jesus, what Jesus was saying, and they laughed at him. They probably mocked him. Surely, they obviously didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in his power and authority or, or, or even have faith in the things that he could do, clearly. 
Church, I want you to hear me when I say this. Jesus spoke two words to the little girl. He said, get up. And it says, immediately she stood and began to walk around. You might be two words away from your healing, but the thing that's keeping it from happening are the people around you, the people surrounding you. Two words only. You know, maybe those two words that you need right now are the same things that Jesus probably said to these people to get them out the house. Get out. Maybe, maybe you need to tell the enemy to get out of your head. Maybe those people who are, are supposed to be your friends, but they're talking nothing but attitudes and negative stuff into your life constantly about everything around you and everything you're doing, get out. Or those coworkers who just annoy you and frustrate you all day long, and then you spend hours thinking about it in the evening, and now you can't even relax, get out. I mean, it can even be family members who stick their nose too far into things, into your life, without anything to offer. Maybe you need to tell them to get out. You know, if you were desperate enough to see God do a miracle for you, you'd be okay with kicking some people to the curb. Or maybe the two words that you're needing are the words that Jesus spoke to the little girl when he said, get up, get up. Maybe you've been waiting and waiting and waiting, crying out for death with desperation. And I'm here to tell you today, your miracle is waiting for your obedience. Get up. Your miracle is waiting for your obedience. You know, your awareness of God's authority will determine how much you receive from him. You might be thinking, I know God can do amazing things. I'm obviously desperate for it. I've been begging for God to heal me for such a long time. I've been begging for a miracle for such a long time. Listen, there's one more thing that is totally, completely necessary in all of this, and that's faith. Faith. Your faith is is directly attached to the awareness of God's power and authority. When you don't have an awareness of God's authority, you're going to struggle with your faith. And some of you are sitting back thinking, I, I believe more than anyone I know, more than anyone in my family. I have more faith in them. I have, I have more faith in any, any of my friends, any of my coworkers. Maybe, maybe you don't have a faith problem and you have an awareness of his, his authority problem. Are you digging into the word? Are you growing in your knowledge of him? Because if you don't know him, it's hard to be aware Point number three today is be strong in faith. You know, when you become desperate, when you're aware of his authority and when you have faith, miracles will happen. I I told you I was going to get a little, uh, be a little open uh, open with you and and get vulnerable uh, with you. And so I'm going to tell you, about nine years ago, give or take some months, probably closer to 10 years now, um, you know, Michelle and I were a couple of years into our marriage at this point. We were trying to have a baby it just wasn't happen, happening. You know, we were trying and trying. We were doing everything right. We were practicing, you know, a lot. It was great, but it just wasn't happening. You know, I, we really wanted to have a baby, and we were so full of hope, and we believed that we were ready. We, we sought the help of doctors even. Like, we, we were desperate for answers as to why we haven't yet gotten pregnant. And we kept praying, and we kept crying out to God. We kept venting to each other, and and expressing our, our emotions and stuff towards each other about it. You know, I didn't fully understand the science behind it, and I probably still don't fully understand it to this day. But at the end of the day, we were told that we, we would, it would be nearly impossible for us to have a child. And that we should consider other, other options like in vitro and, and adoption and things like that. You know, we were told to give up on our dream. We were told to give up on our hopes and our desires, even though we knew and we believed in our heart that that God had promised us to have an opportunity to raise a child that we can give back to him. You know, I didn't fully understand. It was hard to hear. It, It was painful, for sure. Like emotionally, spiritually, everything. We were, it was just draining. We had people around us that we thought wanted the same thing for us. At least they'd say so, and they'd They'd always ask us, are you pregnant yet? Are you pregnant yet? Nobody really spoke negatively about it, but we had people around us. Unfortunately, when we look back and we we evaluate things, we really, you come to realize there's, there were people around us that really wanted control over us. We had people around us that wanted us to fit the mold of what was best for them. They wanted to drag us into their mud pits of drama and it was just exhausting. We couldn't do it. We couldn't. We couldn't be involved with that. So we decided, you know what? 
Let's have a fresh start. Let's, let's go to Texas. You know, Texas is where I consider home. And so I was like, we can go there. We, just, we have some friends. I got my sisters there and stuff. I have some family still. We can do that. And so we, we took a trip down there, and, and Michelle loved the area. So we decided we're just going to move. You know, it's, it's a little easier for us to, to tell ourselves to get out than to tell other people here in Maryland to get out. And so we just said, we're going we're gonna to get out. So we're going to go. So we left, and we went to Texas. And... Uh, you know, we were living a comfortable life. We were, we were happy. We had great salaries from our jobs. We liked our jobs for the most part. You know, we, we had a great time together. We, we were enjoying married life. And then our church did, at the start of the new year, did a 21 days of prayer and fasting. And during this 21 days of prayer and fasting, specifically the Daniel fast, you know, we did all the food uh, fasting and everything that, that you read about when you read about those fasts. We did all of that. We did the praying uh, we were praying desperately for, for uh, having a child. That was our prayer. That was our, our desire for that, during that time. We prayed and we prayed. We, we worshiped together and, and we, we just cried together and did all that stuff, you know. And after 21 days, on day 21, once again, confused, devastated, there's no baby after 21 days thinking God's going to bless us, like we're doing this right, we're doing what he's asked us to do, we were crushed emotionally, mentally, spiritually, everything. We continued to pray, though. We said, God, we know what you promised us. We continued to be desperate for God to perform a miracle because at this point the doctors and science say it's not going to happen. We continued to be in awe of his power even though we were lost and confused in it. We were aware of his authority. We knew the stories from the Bible but we held on to our faith. And then about a month later, Michelle got this feeling. So she took a pregnancy test, and we were pregnant. You know, many of y'all have had the pleasure, I think at this point now, to see Maddie running around, uh, probably pranking you or being sassy and saying hi in different ways and, and whatnot. I want to reread this part of Mark 5 real quick. One more time, starting in verse 35, it says, While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, Your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. That's probably how me and Michelle felt at first. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and welling. And he went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? This child isn't dead. She's only asleep. Church, I'm here to tell you, punctuation matters. You know, I, I believe that every bit of, this, uh, of Scripture, every bit of it, is, is given to us for a reason. Every bit of it is true. Every bit of it is given and inspired by God. It says it in 2 Timothy 3. I believe that every comma, every semicolon, every period is placed for a reason. You ever, you ever uh, think about those phrases that, that say something and they mean something totally different? You know, like, for example, like when you text somebody and you miss the punctuation, I, I firmly, I, I love texting over calling. Texting for me is much easier. I can respond whenever I'm available to, or I can do it on the go if I'm available, if I'm able to, but there's problems with texting. When you text someone, you can't see facial expressions. You can't hear vocal inflections. You can't read body language. You really, you can misread the intentions behind every single word or every single miss of a comma or misplacement of a comma. Here's a couple of examples. Let's eat grandma. Is different than let's eat, grandma. One comma. And then there's $25 dollar bills is $100, but $25 bills is only $25. You see that? The punctuation matters. There is a reason that Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, period. There's a reason why he said to him, just have faith, period. There's a reason why he said, this child isn't dead, comma, or semicolon, depending on the translation you read, she's only asleep. Church, I'm here to tell you right now, don't ever put a period where God has placed a comma. 
Because there may be things that is going in, on in your life where you feel like you're at a dead end or you feel like it is over, but God is saying it isn't over, it's just beginning. You know, when God said, when Jesus said the girls, essentially what he was saying was this girl's story isn't over. She's not dead at all. What comes next, what comes after the comma, what comes after the semicolon is important. She's just asleep. That's the context that you need to pay attention to. Those negative people in that moment, they were exposed. They went from crying to laughing, which tells me they weren't, they weren't even friends of the family. They were probably just there to use Jairus because he was a leader in the synagogue. They were fake. And Jesus demonstrated in that moment that you have to get those people out of your house and out of your circle as fast as you can. I know I'm grateful personally that God's given me a gift of uh, discernment because I, I, don't, I don't want any miracle that's coming my way to be paused due to other people's unbelief. I don't want a, a period to be placed in, in, in something that I'm waiting for and a miracle that I'm praying for where there should be a comma due to negative attitudes that are constantly around me. I don't need other people's uh, lack of faith and their lack of, of trust in God to, to drag me down and kill my faith or my awareness of his power. You know, those, the, these people laughed at Jesus saying that she's not dead, she's asleep, but really unbelief will always laugh at the language of faith. Unbelief will always laugh at the language of faith. Church, when, when the enemy is sitting back laughing, it's time for you to decide in that moment, I'm going to still lift my voice and praise God and tell him, it ain't over, it's just asleep. The same thing that Jesus would have said, this girl is not dead, she's asleep. It's time to tell the enemy to get out because there's no period here. It's just a comma. There's still more to my story. It's time to wake up and to start to praise him before the miracle comes. You know, it really isn't faith if you see it coming before it comes. So I'm here to tell you right now, encourage you to have faith now. You know, as we end every service here, I want, to, I want you to ask yourself this question, what now, God? What now, God? But before I give you the points of the what now, I want to point out one more thing. And I, I chose to speak about this particular story of healing for a reason, because th this girl... Uh, the girl that was dying, Jairus' daughter, she was 12 years old. The woman who was bleeding was bleeding for 12 years. Chronologically speaking, the year that this girl was uh, born is the same year this lady was diagnosed with this disease or this condition. You know, oftentimes we tend to live this selfie-centered life, you know, where we think about me, myself, and I constantly, and we fail to see other people's highs and lows because it's just easier for us to stay in my lane, right? But you know, the Bible has a scripture in Romans that says to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Ironically, but not coincidentally, that's in uh, Romans 12, 15, Romans 12. Not a coincidence. If you dig more into the Word of God and you start to study some things deeper, you'll find that numbers are a big deal in the Bible. They are descriptive and they symbolize things. For example, God called Abraham and began his covenant with his people. And the covenant was continued with Isaac and then culminated with Jacob. Now, in that story, you find that Jacob had 12 sons. And those 12 sons represented power and authority. They become the, 12, the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in the Old Testament, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, they would wear a breastplate with 12 precious jewels on it to represent the 12 tribes of Israel because of the power and authority that they had. And now in the, in the New Testament... The high priest was Jesus. He was 12 years old the first time that you see him go into the temple and start to teach. Now, when he was 30, uh, Jesus chose, what, 12 disciples. Now, it seems, based on what we know about the disciples, it probably would have been a good idea to stop at 11, right? But <laughs> he still let the hater in, and he had to keep with his power and authority thing. So he, he chose 12. 12 is the number of power and authority. And that's why I wanted to start this series with this particular miracle. It's not a coincidence. All of this is here to show you that his power and authority is directly tied to your miracle. It's directly tied to it. Church, I want you to listen. It's time to become desperate for a move of God in your life and for God to do a miracle, for God to heal you of something that you've been waiting on. You know, you might be thinking... I, I've been, I've been sick with this for a long time. I've been having this condition for a long time. My sinuses have been so bad for a long time. I don't think at this point he's willing. You know, there's a story in Matthew 8 where there was a man with leprosy who walked up to him, had the same mentality, and he said, Lord, if you are willing, 
heal me and make me clean. You know what Jesus said to him? He, he reached out his hand and he touched them in Matthew 8, verses 3, and he said, I am willing, be healed. And instantly the man was healed. He is willing. You don't have to question that at all. You can have faith and believe that the same God that healed this leper, the same God that healed the little girl, the same God that healed the woman with the issue of blood after 12 years, he hasn't changed and he's still willing to heal you and still wants to heal you and he wants to do it today. Look, what what are you going to do? Are you going to get up? Are you going to be obedient? God's wanting to heal you. He's wanting to do things in your life. And he wants you to keep those words on your heart and in your mind. I am willing. Be healed. You know, it, it, your healing is already bought with the price. It says it in scripture. It says in Isaiah, by his stripes, you were healed. So I'm going to ask you again, what are you going to do? Here's the points of your what now. Call on Jesus with desperation, like Jairus and the woman did. Get away from things and people that cause you to doubt. Just like Jesus kicked out those negative people. Have faith and then be obedient and get up. You know, as we sing this worship song, if you're waiting on a healing or a miracle or you know someone who is and you want to kind of intercede and pray on behalf of of them, I I want you to do me a favor. And there's a connect card in, in your seat in front of you. On the back side of that, there's a section for prayer. I want you to grab that, take a pen, and I want you to write down the healing that you are waiting on or that you know of someone who's waiting on it, that miracle that you're waiting on. And while the worship team sings this next song, I want you to be bold, and I want you to walk up here and place it at the front of this stage because we're going to take them and we're going to pray over them throughout the week, and we're going to give them to our prayer team to pray over them as well. You can write your name on it if you want. You can even leave it anonymous if, you, if you'd like. If you're watching online, Uh, just send us a message with the healing that you are needing. We want to pray with you. We want to stand in agreement with you. But listen, I I know it can be, you might be thinking, I'm in the middle of the aisle. I I don't think I can get up there when the worship team, when everyone's singing and, and, and standing up. Well, listen, we're a bunch of believers in here, a bunch of people that, that are, are trying to be nice to each other, I think. I think we can let you through and, and let you out so that you can get up here. Just like, you know, the woman with the issue of blood had to fight her way through a crowd of people who didn't want to let her through. Well, we want you. We want to stand in agreement with you. And so please just bring them up here to the front and leave them so that we can uh, pray with you. But use this opportunity to symbolize bringing your need to God, to symbolize your desperation, to symbolize that you understand his power and his authority, and to symbolize that you have faith in that power. Amen. Church, let's pray. God, we we thank you for your word. God, we are so uh, grateful that you have, that you have given us your son, that you have healed, uh, that you have, uh, that you have given us this, 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 this bold confession that we can make even knowing that you sacrificed your son, his body. God, we thank you that we can now claim that by his stripes you are healed, that we don't have to to bear those stripes and bear that, uh, to be that sacrifice for that healing because your son already did it for us. You've already given him. God, we love you and we we thank you for being the same God that you have always been. We thank you for being a miracle working God. And Lord, we ask that you would, that you would do miraculous things in every single person's lives, that you would show them your power you would heal us all of the things that we are struggling with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.